Uh, yeah, let me introduce uh, uh, my colleague, Anna Fedorova, Chief Partnership Officer at Startup Network and CEO of Unicorn Cup. She will present our company. Uh, uh, yes, uh, you're muted. It tells me that I'm muted. Okay, uh, thank you Anastasia very much. Welcome to the unicorn battle in Brazil. We wanted really guys to come to visit you offline, but we are really happy that we managed to do it online because we this way we brought much more people from all parts of the world. And uh, this event is happening Thanks to our sponsors, our global platinum sponsor is Network VC, California Seed Fund, and our global golden sponsor, ICU Ventures. ICU Ventures is a Kiev and London-based venture capital fund that invests in technology companies with ties to Central and Eastern Europe, focused on helping ambitious founders build global businesses. ICU Ventures makes late seed and Series A investments across the tech spectrum. And we would like to thank you, our global silver sponsor, Silicon Valley Syndicate Club. And I would like to remind you that the winner of this battle, together with the winners of all previous battles all over the world, will go together with us to uh, Silicon Valley, uh, July 30th. We hope this date will survive and it will be the finals of our global pitch competition, Unicorn Cup. We had been doing, starting the first quarter of this year, our uh, preliminary battles in 25 countries of the world, 50 major cities of the world, and we are waiting all of you in Silicon Valley down with us. Uh, there'll be a lot of investors, a lot of famous VCs, business angels, there'll be a startup expo. 100 startups will be exposing the innovations. There will be live pitches of startups, the win winners of the, our battles all over the world. So everybody is welcome. And of course, we're welcoming partners and our sponsors to uh, come with us and help all this happen. Uh, I would like to introduce you to uh, companies, our company Startup Network. Startup Network is the marketplace and ecosystem that consists of various online solutions uh, that unites in one business space uh, professionals uh, of, of VC industry and startups and uh, you can solve almost any task in the field of innovation here. Uh, the oldest part of our um, ecosystem is Unicorn Battles. Unicorn Battles uh, is the great opportunities for startups to expose themselves and for investors to find the best deals. And we are welcoming partners uh, to uh, help our battles grow. People who really want their companies to be global, please uh, join us. You can address me or address Anastasia and we will tell you on what terms we can cooperate. And uh, as you see, this is our road roadmap for this year. We have been almost all over the world. And I'm really glad that the Brazil is the first country in uh, Southern America that uh, is hosting us today. And I hope it will not be the last one. So if you see uh, your country here or your city and you would like a uh, startup battles happen there unicorn battles please address us uh, we have been doing battles since uh, 2009 and we have done uh, more than 200 battles already the brazilian is 207 i guess and uh, we are doing on regular basis them in europe in the united states in asia uh, in silicon valley where uh, our headquarters are and offline battles they have a little, a little bit different format and uh, but we are glad that online battles are happening because thus uh, many more people are involved all over the world uh, one of the parts of our family uh, is our Silicon Finance uh, program. It's a pre-acceleration. Uh, we uh, choose uh, the startups who want to relocate to United States, grant them $50,000 worth of uh, uh, services and uh, just in money, and help them to apply to the top American accelerators. 
uh, the best mentors and speakers join our program. So join us also to become a better version of yourself. Network VC California Seed Fund is the most recent part of our family. It uh, is a um, VC fund with the two current strategies. First one, to participate as an investor in our pre-acceleration program. And second one, to be a lead investor in the Silicon Valley Syndicate Club. The Silicon Valley Syndicate Club is a special entity uh, that allows venture syndicates for different startups to be easily organized. Now, any private investor starting with a $10,000 check is able to join our syndicates and get an access to the best startups uh, that we had found through our global network. And it's a great opportunity also for the professionals. Uh, you can lead a chapter of the Silicon Valley Syndicate Club in your region. And if you, if you would like to more, know more, please address me also in oh, Anastasia. And uh, I would like to introduce you to uh, the head of the uh, BC House, Natalie Parshuta, and she will tell you about the recent part of our smart family. Uh, Natalie, are you with us? Yeah. Hello, Anna. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody, and I'm glad to see you here today. I'd like to introduce you to our new project, VC House. Uh, this is um, an invitation-only uh, online community and network created um, exclusively for VCs, where they can exchange uh, deals in which they participate as lead investors. And uh, what is more, this is a platform for specialized offline events uh, where VCs can find investors for their funds. So I invite you to join our VC house. And now I would like to return the floor to our host for today's event, uh, Anastasia. She will lead you through our unicorn battle in Brazil. Anastasia. Uh, we cannot hear you, you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Sorry, no. thanks Natalie. Yeah, um, glad to see all of you and uh, please um, I would like to say thank you to our partners. Um, this is our next slide. Yeah, uh, so thanks for our partners Silicon Finance and also our media partners. It's uh, Bossa Nova and Hack uh, Group. Uh, so thank you guys for spread the world what about our events and invite uh, all guests and startups. Thanks for your support. And I would like to tell uh, about our agenda. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, for now, uh, we will introduce a jury and uh, they have one minute to introduce the cell, themselves and tell about who they are and uh, their funds uh, in what startups are they invest. So then we will start uh, our startup competition and all startups have three minutes to pitch and three minutes for questions and suggestions from judges. Then we will find out who will be the winner and uh, then uh, 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 we have our special guest, uh, Alexandra Johnson. So <clears throat> uh, she is a uh, founder and manager director of Global Technology Capital and co-organizer Unicorn Cup. And she will tell us about VC investments uh, during pandemic uh, before the networking. So please stay for this session too. It will be very interesting. And now, yeah, I would like to say thanks all our honored judges for your time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for your support. And uh, please um, welcome Alexander Saroka, CEO and founder, Startup Network. Alexander, hi. Hi. Hello, everybody. Thanks for, for coming uh, to our unicorn battle. And uh, our fund usually invests from 50 to 
uh, 250k. Uh, geographically, we prefer to invest in uh, United States based or European startups and uh, we are industry agnostic. Thank you. Thanks, Alexander. And I would like to introduce Roman Nikitov. Uh, I see you and our gold sponsor. Yes, hello there. Um, hello, Roman. It was my destination this year. Uh, it was simple, but it, 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 it looks like I'm closing my eyes. But I'm going to make it uh, regardless. So um, uh, I represent ITU Ventures, happy to be part of, uh, of this and many, many other events across the world. I think that Startup Networks is actually bringing the continents together, so I'm traveling along the way. We invest at late stage and uh, round A, um, and uh, we prefer uh, for companies that actually originate from uh, uh, Central or Eastern Europe, but keep uh, about 30% of our portfolio to be that's why we're here. Uh, we invest in 200 million and uh, we're sector agnostic. Um, very looking forward to, uh, to all the pitches uh, today and uh, hopefully you know we'll find something interesting for our portfolio as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> so uh, moving next and if somebody want to jump first, yeah, you are welcome to introduce yourself. So I'm not gonna to introduce. Uh, hi, I'm you. Keith Herman. Okay, uh, yeah, hi. Hi there. Hi. I'm, uh, hi, good to see you all. I'm uh, the uh, founder of IPA Equities, a private investment firm uh, based in Beverly Hills, California. We invest in uh, innovative and disruptive uh, companies across uh, all sectors, Series A and up, minimum $2 million investment. So if you have anything uh, you think we can work together on, we would, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I, I can introduce myself. Yep. Um, hi, I'm Marisa Alma McGinnis, and I'm located in uh, Silicon Valley. I'm a full-time investor in high-tech startups and also local real estate. I'm also an attorney and a real estate broker. Um, I am part of a, I'm an LP with Blumberg Capital and they invest under $10 million, uh, A or seed round, and then also uh, Golden Seeds. And Golden Seeds is like 250,000 to 2 million. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you. Marisa. Thank you. Great to you. have you. Yeah. yeah. Pedro wanted to be next, right? Yeah, sure. So, hello, everyone. My name is Pedro Mesquita. I'm an investment analyst at Mindset Ventures. Mindset Ventures is an early stage venture capital firm. Most of our team is based here in Sao Paulo, Brazil, but we don't invest here in Brazil. We only invest in the US and Israel. And then we help uh, these companies come and do business here in Brazil. So we invest in B2B software companies, mainly in five industries. So FinTech, healthcare, cybersecurity, uh, enterprise software, and agriculture. Uh, so we do from seed up until series B. So as long as the company has some kind of traction, we can invest. And we usually co-invest with local VCs, such as Andrew Horowitz, uh, Sequoia, and some other big names out there. Uh, we are now right now raising our third fund, a fifty million dollar vehicle, and we have uh, forty companies in our portfolio right now. So, and also ten of them are doing business in Brazil already, which shows this value that we try to add to these companies. So, yeah, that's uh, that's my tip. Thank you, Pedro. Thanks for joining us. Um, okay, maybe I'll go next. My name is Aniko Sigetvari. I'm a founding partner at Atlantica Ventures. Atlantica Ventures is an African uh, venture capital fund focused on seed to series B, funding of tech companies in six verticals, fintech, logistics, agri-tech, uh, IoT, uh, digital security, and B2B e-commerce. And we specialize in scaling companies within the continent and also bringing them to other markets. So we recently helped expand one of our Nigerian uh, 
um, unsecured lending company called Migo to Brazil. Um, and my partner is also on the line. His name is Ike Kanu. Nice to meet you. I look forward to Thanks. the battle. Yeah. Nice okay. to meet you too. Thanks for joining us. Yes. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Heath Butler. I am uh, here in the U.S. Uh, in Houston, Texas. It's my first time, so great to meet all of you. Uh, I represent uh, Mercury Fund. We are a $300 million um, uh, assets under management fund. We're on our fourth fund, and uh, we primarily invest in um, B2B SaaS and software, as well as uh, we specialize in marketplaces and tech-enabled services, and we do uh, a lot of uh, industrial IoT type opportunities as well. We either lead or co-lead Series A investments, and um, we primarily focus on the middle of the country, what we call the mid-continent. Uh, we look for opportunities all over the world, uh, and we try to get those companies to move to uh, the middle of the continent where we think there's some uh, arbitrage opportunities. Uh, so excited to be here, looking forward to the battle. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Great. I see Derek has joined us. Derek, would you like to be next? Hey guys, yes, I'm here. Derek, uh, Derek Vitar from Brazil, thanks for hosting this event for the first time here. Very proud to be part of it. Um, basically, I'm a GP and founder of uh, Equal Partnership uh, Early Stage Venture Capital Fund based in Brazil, cross border in the US. Uh, we're investing basically cross border, but in technologies that can be developed further through corporate relationship in Brazil. So basically, we're targeting. Uh, uh, big data and some IoT opportunities. So it's just a big pleasure to be here. Look forward to keeping in touch with all of, all of you. Thanks. Thanks. Great to have you. Hi, everyone. I'm Gabriela. Um, I basically run uh, Brazil Venture Debt, which is the first venture debt um, fund to actually be set up in Brazil. Uh, it's been a new product. We've been active since August. Um, and we are developing the market um, for debt for startups, which is very, very um, small still in the country. Um, we invest in um, absolutely all sectors with the exception of fintechs. Um, and we go a little bit from every range from seed investments up to series B um, and absolutely only in Brazil. Uh, that's a, a rule for the fund. And um, I think that's it. But um, we are looking forward to get to know the companies and maybe do some business in which, you know, we can help leverage investments of the VC funds. Okay, great, thanks. So I'm um, Michel Frang. I'm very honored to be part of this uh, very distinguished panel of judges for what seems to be a fun competition. I'm an operating partner at Bain Capital Private Equity and I represent Bain Capital in Brazil. As such, I support Bain, a local portfolio of companies, and always assess new opportunities for investment. Bain Capital is a diversified uh, set of funds today across very different asset classes, including credit, including real estate, but also including a VC fund that invests uh, seed money and growth tickets across all industries mostly in the US, but uh, always looking for other opportunities in other geographies. We also have a private equity fund that invests bigger tickets, around $150, $200 million in larger, more mature companies. Um, and I'm very happy to be here today. Great to have you. Wonderful, thanks. Okay, Angel, yeah. No, go ahead, Fred. Okay, first. thanks. Yeah. Uh, great to be back. Uh, I was thinking first we take Manhattan, then we take Brazil. Uh, great to be back and see you all guys again and, and all the startups. Uh, my name is Fredrik Tuck. I'm uh, working as head of innovation scouting for a company called Merck Grilling. We are headquartered in Denmark, in uh, Copenhagen. Um, we are looking to find startups to help us develop our business, but also to uh, invest in uh, further on to drive the uh, innovation in our industry and, and in our company. So it's great to be here. I had a lot of good contacts from last week's battle. So uh, looking forward to today as well. Good luck, everybody. Thanks. Great. Hello, yes. this is uh, Victoria. Uh, I'm an associate at the Accelerator Fund based in Southern California. We are international investor for uh, seed and pre-seed uh, um, 
startups and our check size is 100K uh, and our program is eight weeks. I'm very happy to come back and uh, thank you so much for having me. That's great. Do you like this time zone better? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, Marcelo? Hi, everyone. I'm Marcelo, management Marcelo. partner of Drummond Ventures. We are located in the US. I'm here in Boston, but we have offices in Boston, Atlanta, New York, San Francisco, and Miami and Orlando. We also have offices in Sao Paulo and Rio, and Belo Horizonte, sorry. It's really nice to see some familiar face here. We were together last week at New York Battle. So we basically, uh, the majority of our investors are in fintechs, healthcare, education, and biotechs, but we are totally agnostic. So it's a really a pleasure to be here with all of you guys. Thank you, Anna, Anastasia. This nice invitation is really, really great. And I hope uh, and I wish the, the best of luck to all startups that's going to be here teaching today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And. Hi, I'm Dr. Ruchi Dana. I'm a doctor and a Stanford MBA. I represent a Dana family office. So I'm logged in here from Dubai. We invest mainly in early stage and uh, pre-IPO deals. In early stage, seed stage, we invest around 100 to 250K. So uh, as I'm really looking forward to this. Thanks. Thank Great you. to have you. Thanks Wonderful. for joining us. Hi, everyone. Can Hello. I go? Hi, Joe. Hi, everyone. Here's Joe Oliveri from Brazil. I'm uh, the founder of Sales and System Methodology, and uh, I'm also part of some group investment groups like Mucker Capital in the U.S., focused on bringing international companies and companies to, to be growing in America, and also with some angels groups in Brazil, especially Poly Angels. Um, and I also run my work together with some funds specialized in helping them uh, to increase sales, increase revenue, so I work close to them and close to startups. So I'm also joining lots of other accelerator programs. So it's a pleasure to be here with you and to hear some great companies. And thanks everyone to, to choose Brazil as this uh, first step here for you. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Wonderful. And who wants to speak up? I you. will. Hello, pretty. Yeah, we don't see you. We hear you, but I don't see you. Yeah, video is a little bit suspect here with the bandwidth, so excuse me for that, please. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. My name is Preeti Chaudhary, and I represent a platform called Our Venture, wherein we are sector agnostic, and I'm logging in today from India. Our ticket sizes are up to a million dollars via our uh, angels and other investors, and up to $10 million via a high stake table. It's exciting to be here and I'm looking forward to today. Lovely meeting you all. I hope to network with you via LinkedIn. Hi, Frederick. It was nice connecting with you last week. All right, uh, that's me here. Look forward to the rest of today. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's nice. wonderful. Great to see our friends from all over the world. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> And who wants to speak next? Use this opportunity. Yeah. Hey, I'm Josh. Uh, Hi, one Josh. of the managing partners of Convoy Ventures. Uh, we are a seed fund based out of Denver, Colorado and New York City, uh, investing into exclusively video gaming and esports. And so with that focus, we write 250 to 500K checks. Uh, we invest internationally in Sweden, Israel, Canada, uh, and I spent a lot of my life growing up in Africa and Latin America myself. So uh, great to be here and thank you for having me. That's great. And who wants to go next? One, who wants to go next? Two, who wants to go next? Three. Anastasia, I guess you are gonna go next. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again for joining us today and I hope uh, it will be an interesting competition. There are lots of startups and uh, I would like to tell a little bit more about voting process for judges. So uh, dear judges, uh, you 
to start voting, voting you have just click uh, on a link uh, you were sent uh, uh, via email and uh, uh, you you have to put marks uh, depending on investment potential uh, from one to five whereas one is a less potential and five is the highest potential mark so uh, you just put uh, this numbers and you don't need to push any buttons to confirm or something else. You can change your decision while all uh, this uh, startup competition uh, until it will be closed. So if you don't have uh, this voting link, uh, we sent you yesterday or tomorrow morning. So just let me or Julia, our support team, uh, and we will send you uh, this voting link again. So, and also I would like to tell our um, attendees, you also have a chance to uh, put your like for any startups you like and give uh, these startups your support. So go uh, online, register and put your likes. <laughs> So now uh, we are going to start our startup competition where founders have three minutes to pitch and after that three minutes for questions and answers uh, or suggestions from judges. And I would like to introduce your startup. It's Bia Solvit. Hi everyone. Guillermo. Hi Guillermo. Hi. Let's start and I will put a timer for three minutes and we will stop yeah, you if you exceed. can see my screen. Yes, good. Okay, let me know when I can start. Yeah, you can start. Okay, my name is Guilherme Queiroz. I'm the founder and CEO of BioSoft, a Brazilian biotech company applied to new materials. I'm here today to talk about a great problem called oil spills. Almost 6 million tons of oil were spilled in the last five decades, only our seas according to ITOF. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you the BioBlue Network Absorber. Uh, I'm simulating an environmental accident, environmental accident with petroleum, okay? Here we have two tanks and we are putting crude oil in these two tanks in the same quantity. In the first tank, we use polyurethane which was the best alternative for this kind of, the, of accidents before us. In the second tank, we use our product, the BioBlue Natural Absorber. One kilogram of polyurethane, this product, is able to absorb 12 kilograms of oil in 30 minutes. One kilogram of our product absorbs more than 22 kilograms of oil in only 15 minutes. Science being the most efficient, our product is natural made from palm fibers discarded in many crops in Brazil. And the most important, this technology is the only one that allows the reuse of spilled oil. So we can recover the oil from the sea or land and put again to refine. See the, drif the difference between these two tanks and how the oil was clear about our product. Uh, I went to France and Total has challenged us to test our product in the Sedling Institute, and that's the result. Not our technology is the number one in oil absorption. Some competitors for Germany, United Kingdom, and from United States. And our products, we produce absorption barriers, containment barriers as a complementary line, kits for industry, sports, airports, highways, mining stations, and that is the reason because our market is so large. One. $145 billion in 2019. And our revenues last year, $1 million, and our projections to 2023, $85 million. We have just closed our, our uh, Series A, and we have just raised $3.75 million. We've been preparing our company to raise $25 million in the next year. And we are one of 12 finalists in the Startup World Cup in Silicon Valley, and we were accelerated by Plug and Play. And that's our team. 
I'm from Totus, the first Brazilian unicorn, Wagner's the man behind innovation, Giuseppe, an important executive from Telecom Italia, Habib, our R&D director, and Fantina, our raw material supplier and our industrial director. Believe me, this team can change the world, actually between making money and save the world, we choose both. Thank you very much. Thanks, right in time. So now you have three minutes for a question. Hi, I would, uh, I would like to ask like, how do you finally dispose of the, the material? Like after absorbing the oil and like uh, removing the oil from the material, how do you finally dispose it off? Yeah, before our product, um, the oil uh, should be incinerated with the absorber. And now we can recover until 95% of the oil and the product, the absorber must be incinerated too, but we incinerated less product than before, you know? Sure. It avoids heterocontamination and that is the most important about our product. And in terms of other products, like how much uh, oil is recovered from them? Sorry, I can't understand you. So all the other products also uh, can be processed to recover the oil from them, right? So is yeah, your right. recovery rate higher than them? Yeah, you're right. The difference between our product and the other is the, uh, the fact that we can recover the oil, 95% of the oil, and discard only uh, the product, okay? Thanks. Guillermo, how, how does your pri price compare to your competitors? Uh, our product has uh, less cost because we use um, vegetable fibers, discarded vegetable fibers as raw material. After all, um, using our product, the, the total amount, uh, the total cost of remediation is less than the others using our product because we need less products to solve the same accident, you know? Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, well, what is your go-to-market strategy? So how do you access these potential clients and how do you attract them? Yeah, we sell our products here in Brazil through uh, distributors network and through our own team, commercial team. We've been starting an operation in Houston, United States, to expand our business there. And we've been uh, searching, looking for new partners to expand our business all over the world, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Again, well, how, how difficult is it to copy your product? Do you have patents on it? Yeah, we have the patents here in Brazil, in the United States, and in European community in, and in Canada. And I believe that uh, the main reason uh, that avoid the copy is the fact that we have the, the raw material here and the technology uh, is protected by uh, the patents, you know? Thank okay, you. thank you. Thanks, and okay, thank uh, you your so time is up. Uh, yeah, if uh, someone have any questions, you can chat uh, privately or send, uh, you can share your information also in a chat with every, uh, judges and startups. So, please. Uh, uh, okay, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. We are moving next, and the next startup is Agenda Zap. Hello, everyone. Hi. I'm Hi going there. to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Good. So now, yeah, you can start. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Daniel Skoko. I am one of the founders of Agenda Zap. The problem we are trying to solve is this. As you probably know, WhatsApp became the de facto communication platform around the world in many countries, and that's both for personal and professional use. 
But what if you want to call a plumber, for example, and talk to him with WhatsApp, or if you want to order a pizza by WhatsApp? Google is not going to help you because it's cumbersome and time consuming to find WhatsApp numbers on Google. Facebook will not help you either. And that's why we created Agenda Zap, which works basically like yellow pages for WhatsApp. Here's how it looks like. It's a mobile app and a web uh, app as well. Uh, you search for whatever you're looking for, or you click on one of the icons for our most searched terms. The app presents you with all the professionals and businesses that answer to WhatsApp in your city. And with a single click, you can start a WhatsApp chat with that professional or business. About our traction, we launched around one year ago and we, we track our growth in terms of paying subscribers. And as you can see, for most of this year, we have been growing close to 10% uh, a week. Uh, and downloads and active users is growing at the same pace, which we believe is a very healthy growth rate. And even in the face of coronavirus crisis, we are still growing healthily, as you can see, just breaking around 3,000 paying subscribers. Some secondary metrics, as of May 2020, we have 250,000 downloads, and we are only operating the Brazilian market now. Around 100,000 active users per month. We have 70,000 stores and professionals in the platform, and we are operating in 150 Brazilian cities. And we plan to expand to the whole country by the end of the year and internationally starting early next year. Uh, the business model, it's a marketplace. It's free for both sides, and we charge a subscription uh, a monthly subscription from professionals and stores who want more visibility in that, much like Google does in its uh, search engine. We obviously want to be more than just yellow pages for WhatsApp. We are already working on bringing classified ads and job listings. And in the future, we plan to intermediate the transactions themselves and to offer financial services to the professionals and businesses. I'm the co-founder, I'm the CTO, I'm a self-taught the developer, and I have 15 years of experience developing uh, mobile apps. My co-founder, he's uh, our COO, he's a physicist from the top Brazilian university, and we have been very good friends since we were 10 years old or so. Uh, we have been bootstrapped for the first year. We raised $140,000 in March, uh, and we are looking to raise a seed round of 600K in October. Thank you very much. Anastasia, we don't hear you. Yeah, yeah now, yeah, okay. Now you have a questions, yeah. How many yes. of your uh, active users are paid users? Can you help us understand the metrics on that, the, the difference between active and, and paid? Sure, when I say active users, I mean users who are using the app to make searches and find stores or professionals, that's 100,000. Paying professionals or paying businesses, it's, 3,200 3, is the latest uh, number we have. We started offering the premium plan only seven months ago or so. Thank you. Of, of the $600,000, how much goes to PR, marketing, and advertising? And what is your, your strategy? Around 70% of that is going to grow to expansion through paid advertising. Uh, mostly because the numbers are uh, closing so far. Our cost to acquire one paid user is around $15, and the lifetime value is around $30, twice as much. So for every dollar we put into advertising right now, we get two back, uh, but we don't want to rely too much on paid advertising. That's why we are growing features that are going to increase our word of mouth and organic uh, downloads, and it already represents around 15% of our downloads come uh, free and organically. Um, Danielle, so you have this thing, you say 150 cities where you guys are at, right? And it's a little bit for your product to make sense and you know, for anybody living in those cities. It needs to have some sort of volume of you know, services available. If you have only two or three in one of the cities, I mean, it's not gonna pick up as easily. How are you doing to build those networks in specific cities or you just grow organically? You know, 
where they show up or do you have an actual strategy and what's your sales um, strategy on that? We know that since it's a marketplace, we need to have both sides for its work. So we expand city by city. For every city that we want to expand, we, do, uh, we go there and we uh, sign up uh, manually some of the stores so that we have an, an initial supply side. And then only after we have some uh, available professionals and the stores, which varies according to the size of the city, only then we start actively promoting and trying to attack, attract users in that city. So, any other questions? Uh, what's the difference between the free version and the uh, premium version? It's very similar to Google. So, uh, it's free to be a professional and a store and to show up in our search results. But if you want to appear on top of the search results, you need to be a premium subscriber. And there are some other perks as well, like the ability to uh, register a promotion or a discount code and you have some visual uh, effects that call the attention of users toward your, uh, your store. Thanks. So your time is up. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you Thanks. And now uh, we are moving next. And the third startup is 88 InsureTech. And Rodrigo, but probably I can't see him. Maybe it's internet problems. So, okay, we we will wait him. Now we are moving next for fourth startups. GTI plug. Danada, your turn. Yeah, hello everybody. We'll share my screen. Okay. Can you, you see my screen? Mm, yes. Okay. All right, yeah, go ahead. Okay, hello, hi, my name is Leo Lima, head of uh, GTA Plug, the warehouse management platform for small and medium business. Uh, many people be frustrated when they buy a product and the company doesn't deliver on time. In other cases, the company reports that there isn't product in their stock. Then, what was supposed to be a convenience turned into a big inconvenience and frustration. The logistical process realized by these companies is really complex, uh, but it doesn't allow mistakes. I have one question. Do you know why this kind of problem occurs, I will to show. The internal logistics represent 25% of the activities of a small and medium business. However- Excuse me, Leonardo. Can you hello? turn the video? Can you turn the video, please? We can't see you. Stop it, my video. Yeah. Let me check. I have to stop my share screen and come back. And I'll okay. share again. So yeah, it's, yeah, I will pause your presentation. Don't worry about the time. Okay. okay. Yeah, good. So I was talking about the, the internal logistical process and the, uh, uh, due to disorganization, lack of knowledge, and a series of flawed processes, this logistics is only uh, 30 to 50 percent effective, and the, resu the result of this is a big loss of sales. So, uh, I bring the GT plug, a log tech, with the propose is to simplify the life and provide productive for small and medium industries, facilitating their relationship in the supply chain. 
and talk to these industries, we saw that they have two big problems that have not yet been solved well. The first is there isn't adequate control and technology in activities related to the storage and the handling of the products. Another problem is that industries uh, can't access systems or technology to take care of their logistics and story process. And the, we are here to change this situation. GT Plug is a cloud software using BI, designing the reality of these industries. Our platform has the purpose and the mission of simplifying and solving problems related to internal storage logistics. More than a million of small and middle companies in Brazil control their stocks in a paper and pen. That's where we are going to put our software. For this market, our main competitor is the notebook manufacturer. And uh, our business model is based in two plans, monthly and annual. And uh, our software is done and we have uh, paying customers. Uh, this is our awesome founding team and we've been working together for a long time, including we sold another startup in the past. And uh, we are in pursuit of $50,000 of smart money and this investment will be used to sales and the market. To finish, I would like to say that we will help the companies in this new normal uh, because of the COVID in which customer behavior migrates in a accelerate way to digital. We will help them to connect in their e-commerce with their stocks and have full many chain of visibility. Thank you very much. Thanks. So now, any questions from judges? Thanks for the presentation. Could you uh, give us more light on uh, the business size that you're targeting uh, for the clients on the client side? And how far from selling are you? Have you do you have any clients yet? Hi, Derek, I can't hear you. Can you repeat, please? Um, what's, what's your client size, the, the size of the businesses you're targeting, and do you have any sales yet? Yes, yes, we have, we had a, we have a 20, 20 clients, and uh, the, the size of market is more than 1 million of uh, small and medium business here in Brazil that use pen and paper to control their stocks. And uh, our focus is this, these companies. And this is Aniko from Atlantic Ventures. What's the willingness of these companies to actually pay for increased efficiency and, and in actually paying money on a monthly basis? Hi, Aniko. Uh, these companies need to control their stocks because they need to to put everything in omnichannel. Uh, in their case, they sell the products from uh, uh, physical shoppings and uh, e-commerces, and they need to control everything together. And our platform helps them to, to uni unique their control to sell their products and uh, identify uh, their stocks, inventory, and uh, everything that they produce. Uh, yeah. Imagine that. Yeah, go ahead, Pedro. Sorry. Uh, do, do you provide any kind of AI or analytics for your customers for them to better manage manage their inventory or something like this? Hi, Pedro. Yes. Uh, we have two two ways in our platform. First of all, we provide the the operation uh, work, just to receive a product, uh, to control the stock, the inventory. And uh, we have a BI and a lot of analytics to show them uh, predictively, analytics predictively, a lot of information about the best way to, to move the products, the best way to control, uh, to, to organize their stocks, to optimize the, the space because uh, you know that the space is money. If you, you need to rent a big space to put your, your products, you will spend a lot of money, then we we'll, we provide a lot of uh, uh, graphics, a lot of uh, predictive information to them to help them to organize their stocks. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Pedro.
do expect the, the usual players in that space, SAP of this world, uh, to go into this market of smaller companies? Hi, Michel. Uh, actually, uh, there are a lot of, there are some players that sell their products to this, to this, uh, to this kind of companies. However, their focus in a big companies. Uh, to be honest, all the big companies, this market is inflated, is inflated to the big companies. However, our, our target is the small and medium business companies because they, this kind of companies, they don't have a, a money to buy a, a big platform like a SAP and another platform to control their stocks. And uh, uh, we focus in, a, in, a, in a companies that use pen and paper or maximum Excel, uh, Microsoft Excel to control their stocks. And they need to, to use some good platform However, they don't have money to invest a lot of money in a, in a global platform like SAP. Okay, thanks. So, um, we are going to move. Thanks for your presentation. Thanks, Anastasia. Yeah, and so, next one will be Telavita and Andy. Hello there, hi. Hey. I'm Andy Bucas, co-founder and CEO of Televita, a Sao Paulo, Brazil-based startup in the healthcare space. Our mission is to democratize access to healthcare with online consultations. Our current focus is on B2B, and we started out in the mental health space with online therapy. However, we're currently in the process of expanding into telemedicine as well. Um, Looking at Brazil, the healthcare sector is struggling with a number of issues, anywhere from lack of qualified professionals due to long uh, wait times, uh, remote areas without healthcare access and high cost inflation. And drilling even deeper, you can see that there's a high cost of uh, uh, mental health and depression associated at the workplace. The World Health Organization has uh, proven that there is a positive return on investment of Forex of uh, treating mental health at the workplace. And there are numerous scientific studies showing that online therapy uh, reduces care costs while increasing adherence and access. In addition to that, uh, the market has been shown and has been demonstrated to be significant uh, within Brazil and across all of Latin America. Televita is a three-sided managed marketplace. So we basically bring together the patients on the one side and the professionals on the other side whether it's in the mental health space, in the medicine space, in nutrition. And uh, there's a third party that usually pays for that. Um, uh, those payers fall into two main categories. The first main category is insurance providers, where we are an alternative to in-person therapy or in-person doctor's visits. And the second uh, side of that are employers. The needs are slightly different. For the one side, we provide uh, lower costs and higher adherence rates and better clinical outcomes. For the other side, we have a much more preventative approach, and that way we're able to reduce absenteeism <coughs> rates and improve higher productivity rates. How does it work? The process is simple. You open your phone, your, your app, you choose your professional, you book a session uh, at the time and convenience of your choosing, and you conduct your session in our uh, encrypted online environment. Our business model, we have three different pricing models. Uh, fee for service, we charge a fixed cost per session of 50 minutes. There are different tiers based on the experience of the professional, based on ancillary services we, we sell in addition to uh, just pure consultations like population mapping, like um, premium content around uh, education and stimulating a change of behavior. We have a corporate plan which introduces a low fixed fee resulting in a lower cost per session. And we provide value-based care where we link our remuneration to KPIs of the organization. For example, absenteeism or productivity. And as you can see that in these times of COVID, we've been benefiting from a strict in, uh, from a increase in the number of sessions over the last couple of months. 
we have three main differentiators. The first one is that our platform is one of the most advanced in the healthcare space in Brazil. We've been investing in it for the last three years. The second one is we're not an open marketplace. We are a managed marketplace. We have our dedicated clinical staff. All of those are rigorously selected, trained, and monitored. And this way we can provide a much higher level of in, in terms of quality of care. And finally, our, we are strongly focused on clinical outcomes with dashboards, with real-time data, and this way we were able to have a, a greater impact on the improvement of health of our patients. These, this is a selection of our clients across different sectors. Um, we've participated in a number of other competitions, acceleration programs. And finally, just summing up the last point here on funding. So far, we've raised one and a half million from a group of experienced international angel investors. We're getting ready for a series A, but we are also open for discussing a bridge round if that suits. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Now, any questions? What, what's the penetration of smartphone usage in your key target groups? I suppose many of them are older. Uh, it depends. Uh, we attend primarily premium users at this point in time. And I think smartphone penetration is definitely a um, factor because of that. Currently, 82% of all of our users use smartphones uh, rather than laptops. But that is also because we attend the number one premium health insurance provider in Brazil, and they attend executive levels of different companies. Uh, but at the same time, we also attend companies um, in factories and in more rural blue collar job uh, environments. And those people have less smartphones, they have less uh, laptops, so they end up using the corporate workstations that the companies set up for them so they can do the online consultations at their workplace. Okay, thanks. I'm just scared. This, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Uh, this is Aniko. Um, as uh, your platform scales and you, through the B2B, uh, model put on a lot of uh, clients how do you deal with the supply side of um, making sure you have enough qualified practitioners we have a dedicated team which is responsible for managing our clinical staff and uh, our co-founder Milena Rosenthal is one of the pioneers in online mental health she was recognized as businesswoman of the year she's a psychologist she's responsible for our methodology and for managing our clinical staff because of her network and because of her appeal, we have a long list of hundreds of hundred, uh, and thousands of uh, specialists waiting to enter. However, since we have a, a closed clinical staff, which goes through a process of selection and training, um, we don't let more professionals onto our network than we actually need for our customers. The question I had is related to, to the payers. You showed that uh, some of your clients are payers. Yes. Um, aren't you becoming a threat to them by building you know, a, a set of data about their patients somehow that they probably would like to own? Yes, I'm sure they would like to own it, but at the moment they don't. And by us providing that data to them, we become a much more attractive um, uh, supplier to them. The way we position ourselves towards those players um, is that we are an alternative to a, a physical clinic. So we're a virtual clinic and we're a scalable clinic. And that allows them to attend patients in any kind of environment, in any kind of uh, geographical location. But as a bonus on top of that, we're also providing them with additional data. And how do you compete against, I guess, uh, hospitals and existing clinics? who I'm sure are uh, developing or using or renting platforms and already have doctors and sometimes a brand name? Um, that is an important factor. Some of them have become partners of ours as they uh, put their clinical staff onto our platform to monetize free capacity. However, we don't really see them as a, as a big competitor because physical treatment, physical consultations will never go away for certain types of treatment. However, um, we can act as a funnel for them and we can actually direct patients to them for the physical follow-up exams. Thank you. So can you do prescriptions without seeing the patient? The legislation in Brazil for online prescriptions was just passed due, due to the coronavirus crisis. 
And we're in the process of integrating with two other startups that do the online prescriptions. Thanks. So time is up and thanks, thanks you for much. your presentation. Yeah, good luck. So um, we have our third startups uh, eventually connected with us. So, and I would like to introduce uh, third startup, 88 InsureTech and Rodrigo. And I'm okay. mute, uh, Rodrigo. Okay. Oh, yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, Hello. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Rodrigo Ventura, founder of 88 InsureTech. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, make it full, please. And yeah, we will all see it. Okay. Just one second. Okay, mm -hmm. it's full. Yeah, great. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, 88 InsureTech, it is uh, an ecosystem of protection for multiple digital ecosystems. We are talking about insurance uh, distributed via massive uh, distribution channels, uh, mobility platforms, fintechs, uh, where we transform the journey from uh, uh, manual in paper and bureaucratic time consuming to something intuitive, uh, uh, simple and digital via APIs, via uh, website and uh, apps. Uh, the insurance pricing, we also uh, make a different kind of insurance price based on behavior uh, and on demand. Uh, this means that the insurance turn on and <coughs> off automatically. And then uh, the whole life cycle of a policy after you issue the policy um, is managed in the blockchain. Therefore, it's much more transparent and uh, as well the payment process much more faster for the client, transforming the, the whole life cycle experience from the moment you buy, how it's priced and how it's managed until the claim. Um, our mission it is to democratize insurance, building inclusive solutions that uh, reduce the cost of living, uh, generate savings and as well uh, uh, engage, increased engagement of the clients in this uh, B2B as B2C approach through the, the, the tech platforms. Um, we have an amazing team um, of people who, who really knows insurance uh, area and um, investors from uh, the traditional insurance market, the big four companies, serial entrepreneurs, blockchain entrepreneurs, um, joining forces here and um, we have the whole journey of insurance everything in one single place from the front to office to the back office uh, where we have social login to reduce the friction of identify, identifying the, the, the customer then um, the automatic detection of the device in this case we are talking about mobile phone insurance uh, uh, it automatically detects the manufacturer, the model, the EMI number. Um, then you, you can personalize your insurance is selecting uh, the amount of coverages, types of coverages. You receive a proposal and this proposal, and once you receive, you can uh, select, for example, the type of a payment. If you wanted to pay in a credit card, in a subscription plan, or if you wanted to uh, buy um, the insurance using uh, an, a traditional invoice with a barcode, and or uh, with digital currencies. And uh, with digital currencies, we also uh, generate dynamic QR code for this uh, payment of the insurance policy and the conciliation of crypto fiat uh, to issue a policy instantly and then register this policy issue in the blockchain. In this case, we have a smart contract running on RSK. And here we have the time stamping of a policy registered in the name blockchain. Uh, and from this uh, app, you can also um, manage your insurance policies, uh, notice a claim. You have a member get member process where you can receive progressive discounts by sharing and carrying your unique code with your friends. Um, 
and they if they buy the insurance you you receive uh, cashbacks um, all the uh, CRM with chat and fact to the client and uh, as well the profiling in terms and conditions so this is the basic architecture where we are now um, and uh, we tested different flavors of blockchain and we learned it that uh, depending of a type of insurance uh, and uh, related to the cost, uh, we, we should use uh, different types of blockchain. Uh, for example, for micro insurance, it's more reasonable to use NAND blockchain for the cost of transactions. Um, Thanks, Rodrigo. Your time is up. Just speed up and finish. Okay, so uh, we have a, a proposal of a, a digital transformation and um, everything that I'm demonstrating here is up and running. So um, I'm open to questions. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Are you, are you currently operating on the NEM blockchain? Yes. And what, what type of payments primarily are those? You're saying they're more micro? Uh, well, in this in, in this journey of insurance transformation, the policy uh, we can manage traditional insurance policies by time stamping them, and all the events related in the blockchain, like notice of a claim in the regulation process until the settlement, and um, uh, in this journey for non-parametric migrating into parametric products, uh, this means uh, the the the. the the smart insurance policy auto regulates itself. So yeah, I, yeah, I'm then, aware of that. Yeah. In then we are doing this non-parametric and doing the, the series of time stampings of all the events related. Are you doing different policies on different blockchains? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. That was my question. Okay. Because for an insurance that costs one dollar and twelve cents, it doesn't make sense. You you pay for a transaction higher than the cost of insurance itself. Uh, could you share a little bit more about your traction? How many clients you already have? Uh, yes. Uh, um, we uh, sold about a thousand policies for smart insurance policies. Uh, um, we started in November and uh, since November we got a, a, just a little bit of, uh, more than thousand policies for smart insurance. Uh, we are selling for example uh, guarantee warranty insurance as well in a B2B approach and uh, in this case we issue about a million reais, Brazilian reais in policies. Uh, those are uh, 176 policies so summing up about a million. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you check it out our website, 88i.io, uh, you will see that we are also, let's say, changing the wings uh, during the flight. So we are launching new products and, and testing them in this COVID scenario with telemedicine and also life insurance with personal accidents, combining, emulating uh, health insurance uh, protection. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. So, any other questions? Thirty seconds. No. So, okay. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation and join us eventually. Yeah. Thanks. So, uh, for now, we are moving next, and uh, the next startup is. Okay. Expedente Ezo and Roberta. Hello, I want to share my screen. Hello. Okay. You don't need me to help you? Okay. No, I think it's working. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Okay, so here is the pitch. Minimize. Start. Okay. So, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm going to show you the secret to digital onboarding in a quick and painless fashion for the financial and insurance sector. So the first thing uh, a person or a company sees when they want to get a very large loan is a list of all the documents that they have to send to the financial institution. And this is the phase the customer usually makes. 
Why? Because as he begins to send documentation to the financial officer, always the same thing happens. Some documents are wrong, missing, outdated, missing stamp, missing interest, so on and so forth. And this creates a back and forth, back and forth of communications and emails and even visits to the financial institution of you. Everything is correct or until the customer simply desists. And what's very important is that no documents means no business. And the technology used today in this billion dollar industry are basically post-its. This is a real image I took in a financial institution or email. And you can see some subject lines like third time to charm. So you can bet that that document was sent incorrectly at least three times. So yes. And this is where Expedient Azul comes in. Expedient Azul is an online onboarding platform that in one screen shows the customer everything that he has to do and all of the documentation he has to send in order for a the process to be completed successfully. So if you can see right there in one screen, the status of each and every one of the documents that he has to send or actions that he has to take. And when he opens one of these squares, this is a detailed description of everything that he has to do. And if he has to send documentation, he can upload it right there, or right there, see why the document was uploaded incorrectly. And every day we send email reminders to everyone involved in this document gathering process, showing them uh, the status of what's going on with this documentation. And for the first time, we give onboarding teams visibility of what's going on in this process. So we show exactly the companies and what's happening with each, with each of their customers that are being usually onboarded by email or basically by the documentation. So right now, we are mainly working in Mexico, Brazil, and in other countries, uh, in the Caribbean and US. And the most important things that we have seen is that uh, the process time is reduced more than three times using our platform because of all the automations we have and the simplicity for the end user to send documentation and understand what's going on. But most importantly, we reduce customer abandonment. So more uh, customers that begin to get onboarded with our platform complete the process and at the end more sales are completed. We charge by the amount of usage, so our platform adapts perfectly to any size of financial or insurance institution. We have been growing 15% month over month in usage. So uh, this is from uh, our start in May, March 2017 all the way to last month. In terms of the team, uh, we have a very good balance of tech skills uh, and business skills. Uh, well, my co-founder was a large loan broker, so he actually collected hundreds or thousands of all of this documentation by hand, and he was the one that discovered this problem. And right now we are raising $500,000 to create a fully digital onboarding experience. So uh, join us, uh, investors, where is your paperwork? I don't know if you remember this uh, character here from the movie Monster Scene. Uh, this is the character that asks other uh, characters for the documentation. And this is the image customers have of financial institutions or insurance institutions in this document and onboarding processes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Now, any questions? It was very relaxed music on the background. <laughs> so, judges, any questions? No? So, okay, please uh, stop sharing. Well, I really didn't understand what you're onboarding. Uh, well, we work in the financial and insurance sector. So when you want to get a very large loan, for example, uh, for your company, to maybe build a building or uh, to uh, buy machinery, uh, large loans are like 50% of the lot of the loan market. So most of the loans or fintechs you see around there are focused on consumer loans. So that's 50% of the market but we focus on the 50% of the market that doesn't really have a lot of focus right now, which is the large loan sector. And when you want one of these very large loans, you will have to send to the financial institution around 30 or 45 documents. And everything is done completely manually by email. And this is the problem we are solving. It just takes a long time. It's very painful for everybody. And there's no automation in this sector. So how uh, is, um, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So this question is, how is um, regulation impacting your business? Is this externally or internally driven uh, for banks to use your platform? It doesn't affect us because in large uh, financial institutions, our solution is set up on site. So it doesn't really matter. 
and in small financial institutions, at the end, we are onboarding customers that have not yet signed a loan. So regulation says that when the customer, when the interested individual or company is not really your customer, you don't really have to have a lot of uh, security in place for the time of documentation. So it doesn't really, it doesn't really affect us uh, in any scenario. If it's a very large institution, we can just set it up in any house. If it's a small institution, they usually just go to work with customers and uh, before they actually sign a contract that they are looking for a loan. So if I am not sure if this will be totally compliant with uh, one of these users, it's actually a customer. And just sorry, as a follow-on question, what's your say, sales cycle in getting some of these banks and insurance companies to um, to connect with you? Uh, well, integrate, full integrate. Yeah. Our, our since usually the our customers are usually just using a email to onboard. The integration is very simple because we just say to them like, hey, you know, instead of using uh, all the emails to ask for information or post it to follow up. Use our tool, and once all the documentation gathered is correct, it just goes into your existing workflow system to analyze uh, the process. So it's very, very simple. We don't we really just blend with our process. We don't really go in and break anything because we are just focusing on an area that nobody is focusing on because everybody assumes that the customer will send all the documentation correct at the first shot and in one email. Which is totally false. This is why this has been a very neglected area because uh, financial institutions seem like, well, you want a loan and I'm asking you for three documents, you're going to send them right to the first shot. But that's not really how it works. Uh, especially in Latin American countries that require a lot of follow up, uh, you need a tool like this to actually follow up on the customer to gather all the documentation to be able to process this loan. Or if it's, a, if it's an insurance claim, it's exactly the same thing, you will need a lot of documents to process large insurance claims. Uh, so yeah, so basically, just to give, just to pull the finish up, it's very easy to uh, when what we approach one of these customers, we ask them like, how do you get the documentation from your customers? And they answer email, and then we ask, do you do the customer send everything right in the first shot? And they also like, no. And then that's what we got, we got to listen to us because uh, nobody has to do so this. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Roberta. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Zadab. And we are going next. Uh, three startups left. And next one is a pocket clinic. And Damir. Hello. Can you see my picture, my screen? Yeah, make it full. Okay. Great. Oh, okay. Hello, Hi. I'm Amir C. Sorry. Hello, I'm Amir CEO and founder of Pocket Clinic. More than 460 million people suffer from a chronic illness called diabetes, which means one in 11 people among us. Life of 10% of them depends on a drug called insulin, although this is a lifesaver and keep them alive, but it's not an easy drug to administer. In these modern times, still most of diabetes use old fashioned treatment, which is syringe, and, get, and it causes overdose or underdose due to inaccurate calculation that they make. More than 1 million children are insulin dependent and 128,000 diagnosed each year and added to this number. Imagine that they are dealing with unfixed dose drug 24-7 for lifetime. It should be a better way for them. Yes, there is. This is the newest technology that market offer. It is what it looks like. It's a piece of hospital equipment that was basically developed in a medical device mindset. It is very complicated expensive, and almost 40% of a user stop using it within nine months. It's not a consumer device, and for these disease, that's what we need. This is our goal, living where real people live, which is a smartphone. This is the most effective, most compactful human-machine interface ever developed in history. To inform our solution, we joined diabetes patient community and asked them what their biggest challenges were in managing their disease. And we, found, we ended up connecting directly with 150 patients and 10 doctors, and we found out two of the biggest problems are. First, current solution is expensive, and in countries like Brazil, they're not covered by insurance. The second is the modern devices are completely closed ecosystem, meaning that is one size fits all solution. That is not appropriate for managing each patient's needs. 
our solution is not a mobile app. It's a consumer medical device that controls with the smartphone. It's pain-free, easy to use, and the smallest pump in the market. We use AI system to optimize the insulin dosing while delivering updates to family member. And our mobile application is open protocol, which means that you can upload any algorithm or connect with any sensors that you want. With our business model, we are able to reduce upfront investment and with subscription model with fee, we can make it affordable for all income classes, even without insurance coverage. We are differentiated on two main dimensions, interoperability and price, which makes us unique in this market. The global market for insulin delivery devices valued 21.8 billion by 2025, and in Latin America specifically reached to 1.38 billion, and we're targeting 1% of a global market. Our team is divided in two sectors, engineering and medicine. Our team has overall more than 24 years experience in this field. In order to accomplish our goal, we are seeking an investment for one two point million dollars, which is 300K of it is self committed already. This money helps us to fabricate our first batch, grow our team, and apply for regulatory permission. Diabetes don't choose their disease, but they have the right to choose their treatment. Thank you very much. Thanks. That's the right thing. So, any questions right now? What, what exactly, I, I must have missed this, how exactly do they administer the insulin? Uh, normally they use, uh, most of the diabetes use syringe or injection by the pen. And because the, the pump, the modern technology is a little bit expensive. And here in Brazil, um, there is no insurance coverage that cover the cost of insurance, the, the, the pump. Okay, so basically what you're offering is the, um, the analytics for the dosing, is that correct? No, we are offering the automatic injection that the cost of the same of the injection by the syringe or pen which is okay. controlled by a smartphone. And it has a capability to optimize the dosing because uh, with the syringe, you, have, you make the spark of injection, for example, uh, overdose or underdose to the patient because they need to inject four times per day. And it causes death finally if they do uh, overdose or underdose. But automatically injection, which is automatically injected per hour or when they have some carbohydrates, they calculate it by the mobile application, inject the correct amount of insulin uh, wireless to the, uh, to the pump. Thank you. You're welcome. So how big is the device? Did, did you have a picture of it? Uh, yes, I mean, this, this is the normal size. As you can see, it's a wearable device. Yeah. Uh, it's a, attachable to the patient body, connected to via Bluetooth. The size is 46 millimeter. The thickness is uh, 1.2 centimeter. The smallest pump in the market. And it's, hmm. uh, it's a circle shape. Hi, this is I.K. Kanu from Atlantic Adventures. Yeah. What stage are you in terms of your uh, any FDA approval or testing? Because you'll be looking at it from an algorithm perspective, communications because using Bluetooth between the phone and the device, and then also even the delivery system for the pump itself. So what stages are you in in terms of testing and all of those? Yeah, we are right now. We are. I'm finishing the manufacturing design, and 90% uh, is done, and uh, we are ready to apply for a laboratory test because uh, this is the pump is the class three in Brazil, but in most of the countries like the US it is a class two of classification, just need to pass the regulatory of uh, just passing the laboratory test. Okay. But here uh, we need to uh, do the laboratory test and apply for the clinical trial. And, and what about the security protocol around the communication between the, the device and the phone? Yeah, I'm using the new technology from the BlackBerry and I applied the microprocessor that's uh, cybersecurity, the communication between the mobile and uh, the, uh, the pump pod, which uh, encrypted in a mobile application. When you send the, the command to the, mob, to the pod, it's uh, completely secure. Okay. Okay, thank you. 
Thanks for your presentation. You're welcome. And just, we're at two startups left. And just quick reminder for judges, please vote, uh, make, put your marks on each startup and we will find out who will win. So um, the next startup is H3 Dynamics and Emilia. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Okay, this one. We can see you and yeah. Just one second here. Okay. Okay, go ahead. So, okay. So, hello everybody. Um, my name is Emilio. I'm from AG3 Dynamics in Brazil. My pitch is the Remote Telerobotics Network for Emergency Dam Action Plan for Visual Inspection and Live Incident uh, Emergency. So, last year, near 300 people died in mining tailing uh, dam collapse. One of them caused the greatest environmental impact in Brazilian history. And today we have uh, several high risk and critical dams in Brazil. And after dam disasters, alert serum sales increased 300% in Brazil. And the market is now looking for redundancies or alternatives for the serums because they can fail and fail in the past. Well, having Brazilian co founders at 83 Dynamics with long history of expertise on dam projects, we propose. Uh, first, uh, preventative inspection with uh, our telerobotics infrastructure. So drone in a box connected to the cloud for data analytics with AI uh, support to generate inspection reports after validation from engineers working at, at the office or at home, just right, like, like now. Uh, then, so then it can be inspected more frequently with more updated information for decision making. Also, uh, the National Mining Agency resolution in Brazil says that mining them with high associated potential damage must implement automated instrumentation, monitoring system, and automated warning systems until the end of this year. So it means that our telerobotics uh, infrastructure can be connected to a hub software that monitors dams through instrumentation and launches the drone automatically for a sequence of actions for fast response, like checking the dam, then alert the population within a minute uh, with a loudspeaker in their respective risk zones. And then after that, uh, missions of search and rescue. So everything happening during the first 30 minutes, so it can save many lives. Uh, from near 5,000 dams that are subject to the National Dam Safety Plan, almost half uh, belong to eight companies from mining sector and some of them are in touch with us at the moment as well as the hydropower uh, sector. The revenue uh, forecast we consider 20% market share in 2025 and this forecast can be extended to the global den market after we uh, uh, deploy here in Brazil and also we are having demand for other applications here in Brazil uh, for asset monitoring and crisis management. So it's a huge uh, global market. So we can also explore this market. So, well, thank you very much for the opportunity to present to you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, right in time. You're welcome. Thanks for the yeah. presentation. Um, I'm curious about how scalable uh, your process and sales is. Okay, uh, usually huge infrastructures or remote infrastructures, they have some challenges because of they are remote, they have some, sometimes inspections danger, dangerous. So for, to give scalability, we developed the, the, the drone in a box to collect the data automatically, okay, communicating with a monitoring, central monitoring through 4G or satellite. And the other side, we had a challenge, that is we would collect so much data. So um, to solve this, we are planning uh, the AI to help the workflow 
to make the data analytics as well help the engineers to analyze the data. So today we are doing this with a lot of success for building inspections uh, to collect data with normal drones, okay, not in the box, but the AI is helping. But for huge infrastructure, so we have a challenge to, to make inspections, in the case also fast response incidents, very fast. So we have a drone inside a box uh, monitored uh, from a central a command. And so within a minute, we can launch the drone for fast response or for routine uh, visual inspections. So basically we have two challenges, this uh, communication and also in some countries, drone regulation for some operations because it's so far away from the, the, the drone pilot, but it's, it's happening all around the world, starting the process. And in Brazil, for some projects, we can achieve the BV loss, that is the beyond visual line of sight operation. So in some situations, we can apply the, the market, uh, the regulation, and some of them we need to pass through the aviation agency to get the approval. Okay. So the main challenge, like today and yesterday, I had two demands here in Brazil for around three, 300 kilometers uh, to, to make inspections and monitoring of railways and also power lines. So this is the most challenging for drones all around the world. But we have a lot of demands. And for fast response emergency, we don't need such approval. Uh, it's kind of automatically approved for BVL operation during emergencies. Okay. On, this is Aniko from Atlantic Adventures. Just on the telecommunication side, I assume these mines are in relatively remote areas, so you may, may not have the usual mobile networks, but you rely on satellite communications. And I would assume a lot of it is uplink info, not downlink, so the traditional satellites may not be able to handle it. Um, uh, what percentage of, of your cost structure is actually uh, linked to telecommunications? Well, usually um, well, one thing that will solve is the next generation of communication, the 5G. So we are getting prepared for that. Uh, in Singapore, uh, we have our headquarters. We have Singatel. Uh, here in Brazil, we are talking to a team and um, not for satellite, but for 5G and Vivo, okay. Also, we have some partners that can fill some gaps, um, like, um, what's the company here? I forgot the company, it's not here, but it's helping I to- I saw Thales on it, but they, they make satellites, yeah. They don't- uh, Yes, uh, Thales, Thales, actually, them. our relationship with them is regarding to protect airports, so they can detect the uh, drone, and then our drone box releases the drone to attack the, the drone that is invading, okay? Uh, but also Talus and NEC, they can compress the data. And so it enables to, to, to send uh, the data through satellite or 4G, okay? So we have some partners to, to fill some gaps in the infrastructure. Um, so SAP for integration with the industry, uh, Oracle for communication also, live communication for police, for example, or a central mo monitoring center. So um, we have some partners to fill some gaps, like these ones that, uh, that are in the slide. Uh, hi, Emilio, um, for the care. Mm, thanks for the presentation. The question yeah. is, I've seen a lot of presentations now on different types of surveillance with drones, uh, what would you, what would you say is your competitive advantage? Okay, uh, we we are now we decided um, not to develop our own drones. Okay, uh, we focus on the shelter, um, and so we can use the best drones available uh, for with a lot of sensors options. We also have, but not for now. We are a manufacturer and developer of hydrogen fuel cells. So we can have a, a drone with multi-rotor that usually today has uh, 30 to 50 minutes. So we have a hydrogen fuel cell drone with 30 
0.5 hours of, of endurance. So that can be, can be implemented on such a platform. Not, not for now, but in the near future. So this, this is one advantage for the future that we have a long endurance drone. Uh, we are also having such partners, uh, Oracle, Schneider, Via, Cisco, integrating, helping to integrate our solution for different applications. So um, uh, this is one of our differentiations. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry, just, just one question, Emilio. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, first yeah. of all, congratulations for your, your presentation, but also Thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned that you, you, you are trying to talk to these eight big players in Brazil. Uh, have you touched the base with one of them about corporate venture investment in your company or you're looking for $500,000? That, that's, yeah, that's here, here in Brazil, yeah. Um, in our headquarters, we are in a Series B. I don't know if I have the slide here, the last one. Sorry. Uh, rare fascinating. Okay, so we are in, in the headquarters, 21 million Series B in progress, 8 million already closed, okay? But particularly for the Brazilian market um, that I presented here, we, we are uh, raising between $500,000 and 1 million uh, for our local market. And uh, for the dam, okay, but where other opportunities are happening for other applications here in Brazil. So we have two opportunities there. One is then at headquarters, another one is focused on Brazilian market, especially for them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for your presentation. And we are going next. Thank you. So and the last but not least is Agria startup and yeah, one second. Yeah. Let yeah. our friend exit from share. Uh, this, uh, yeah, stop sharing your screen. Yes, I don't know what's Anywhere? sorry. I'm trying to find the, the on the top screen. on the top of no. your screen. Oh okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. No, it's okay. Mm -hmm. can see there. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. Okay, good. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I am here to talk about one of the biggest challenges of our times. 500 million farming families around the globe which have no access to financial services at all. And we are in 2020, believe in it or not. Uh, and why this is so important? This is very important because uh, those farmers, those 500 million farming families around the globe will be responsible for the extra supply in food and fibers by the 2050 when we will have two uh, uh, extra 2.5 billion people on earth. We will have 10 billion on this planet, 10 billion people on this planet. And we need to increase the capital access by $2 trillion every year from, the, from today up to there to solve this gap. This is why we are building Agrio as a, a solution to bring the services to those farmers. And how do, do we do that? Doing, uh, becoming a, co a global connector between farmers and capital as a, a global risk intelligence provider. How, how this works? So Agrio has a different uh, tech stack from the bottom up where we combine different sorts of data uh, with our proprietary modeling with the uh, DLT infrastructure layer where we can uh, transact in terms of digital transaction, but not only that, we can bring, bring proofs of services, of trust of F for each services we provide. We provide those services in risk intelligence, pre and during contracts, in, in the lending contracts, in the insurance, uh, in the land value for collateralization and uh, some other services coming now. Companies can use our services to enable their, their uh, providing uh, their, their financial services to farmers uh, directly to the APIs using our front-end services. 
uh, even our mobile infrastructure. Basically, we do checks in different type of information through our system to provide those services, uh, which I mentioned before. Uh, in a way where the companies can receive the farmer requests directly from the farmer or by the, their operator, operators on the field, uh, request through our system and get all back the information the last 20 years in like a 10 minutes process and have a much better decision and monitoring of the systems. Uh, we have the services in the risk intelligence, in uh, contracts monitoring, which is basically during the, the financial contracts, what's going on in the field, fraud detection, crop insurance, uh, adjust a new service in the forest uh, sector, and a land value for collateralization. We just uh, have been get some traction in a couple of uh, last months, and we are uh, now in the phase deploying these services in South America uh, and uh, US. This company is led by two PhDs in the area with a lot of experience, and we are looking to raise $1.2 million uh, to achieve our next uh, 700,000 requests through the system. So thank you and I'm open to the questions. Thanks. So any questions? I guess, I guess nobody got the, the point. <laughs> Sometimes they need some time. <laughs> yeah, uh, I did. Yeah. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question is, who's your prime customer? Is it the banks or the farmers? Uh, our primary customer uh, as a B2B provider in a SaaS model are companies, banks, insurance companies, uh, yeah. trading companies like we are operating today, uh, agri uh, corps, uh, trading companies, uh, and cooperatives too, which they need where they need to look what's going on, decide, take a decision about some type of operation in a way where they can do uh, without uh, relying other people on the field, which is basically what's happened today all, 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 all over the world. And they can uh, have proofs about, so they, a bank can prove to insurance company how they did, how they decide, how they are managed their portfolio or a, cooperative can prove to a bank or any player. So we dissolve disputes. Not only that, we provide uh, the support to the decision itself. Can you explain your revenue and the, uh, the, the amount that you came up with for the funding round? Yeah, uh, so basically what our revenue model is based on a flat fee per requests, plus a value based on the size of the request. Let's say a hundred hectares farmer uh, solicitation from, let's say a company like Bungi. A uh, hundred hectares is for pre-contract evaluation is $5 flat fee, flat fee plus uh, uh, 10 cents per hectare. So 100 hectares plus more uh, $10, so $15 to receive all the analytics pre-contract to take a decision if this is a good place or not, whatever. Um, and this seed round is focused to the next uh, 18 months uh, to have an, uh, a team and, uh, big enough and strong enough to grow this uh, number of requests, this uh, 700,000 requests, which is more or less uh, to do that, we need to process 150,000 farmers on average uh, for, for different services. What means uh, are between 10 and 15 companies, the type of companies we are addressing uh, using the services. What is the average size uh, of the farmers, the uh, average size of land that they manage? Yeah, in the case of Brazil, it's 71 hectares. Uh, in South America, it's 52, 52 hectares. Uh, globally, if I don't miss now, it's around 49. But you have different regions. For example, you have uh, on average uh, this number, but you have, for example, our primary goal today is medium, high, medium uh, big uh, farmers, which in the case of Brazil is over 230 
hectares because this comp these farmers are uh, under uh, connection with companies like companies we are talking and using ourselves now. Mm -hmm. uh, in US, which is the secondary market, we, we, we are starting now there. Uh, uh, it's around 300 hectares, this mm -hmm. uh, primary focus. So it just this variates a bit. This $10 in the our projections is basically because we are looking for the next two years, this year and next, uh, address Americas first. So with this size of uh, operation, we can onboard our big guys now and some small, medium farmers in the coming months. So the, sorry, as a follow-on question, the 150,000 farmers, they are not just then in, in Brazil. It's all of no. all of the Americas? Yeah, but let you, okay. you need to And what percent of that? Yeah, just trying to figure out what percent of that. Yeah, Brazil, only, farmers, Brazil has five, percent. only Brazil has 5.2 million farmers. Only 700,000 last year in the census, 2017, in fact. Uh, the, the numbers was released in last year. Uh, only seven, 750,000 farmers, less than 15% of the all Brazilian farmers receive some type of financial service. Insurance, credit, barter operation, which exchange, exchange between inputs and, uh, and crops and the end of the contract. Uh, this all classified by uh, the, the IBGE as financial operations uh, is less than 15% in 2017, which was released in the last census uh, last year. Uh, in Americas, we have 12 million far farming families uh, in general, uh, and we have more than 10 million uh, without services. In North America now, we have uh, there are a lot of farmers uh, with constraints to achieve credit because it's floods and all this type of problems there, even in the biggest market for financial services in the agribusiness. So um, we have a, a quite good number of farmers uh, on these Americas for the first step, and we will operate over uh, less than 1% uh, in the coming years, and we're reaching 1% of those millions of farmers. It's quite good uh, space to, to make money. What are the terms of the, of the seed round, and have you considered uh, asking for more money? Yeah, we consider, in fact, we have a much bigger goal, but the, pro the point is, uh, if we can close this, we can easily go over these goals in terms of revenue. Uh, so the, pri the, the primary goal is to close the rounds uh, uh, and the terms of, uh, we are looking for valuation rounds uh, or over $7 million. Of course, this is uh, open to discussion, especially when it comes with some potential operations uh, and as partner, as part of the round. Uh, but uh, the, the goal now is to push forward because we just have a contact connection with a, the, one of the biggest insurance companies on earth. And one of the points they raise is your team is too small to work with us. And so we cannot lose some contracts like could bring us $2 million a month, not a year, a month. When we almost get a door uh, in the face because the our side of the team today. So we cannot we cannot have this situation again. So we are rushing to we change the strategy to rush to to get the, the round done. Okay, thanks. Thanks for your presentation. Thanks for coming. So and now I would like to ask all judges finish your voting. Put your last marks for all startups, and we will announce the winner. Yes, it will. You have one, maybe two more minutes to finish voting. And yeah, and, we'll, uh, and after after that, after announcing the winner, we will have a special guest, Sasha Alexander Johnson, will tell us some insights from California, and then we'll have a networking discussion with all our judges. 
So the most interesting is just starting. Okay. Yeah, and I would say that the it's winner it. is invited to our Unicorn Cup finals, which will held in Silicon Valley. Uh, and it will be a great opportunity to pitch in front of lots of venture capitals and investors. It's a pity we just don't know when, yeah, it will be. <laughs> yeah, this is, yeah. <laughs> For now, yeah, the date is not. We hope it will be in July, but now probably we understand that yeah. we need to make another date for this event, yes, Anna? Uh, the last time I tried to call Trump, he didn't pick up the phone, so I <laughs> for sure when we will be able to invite all those people from all over the world to the United States. That but you know, it's now a hard times in US, so it's, yeah, probably yeah. It's, not, it's not safe to fly there. So, oh, online is always safer, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I see that we already know who won the third place, the second and the first one, right? Anastasia? So let's start um, from the third place. Okay, and the third place goes to Agria. Oh. Ooh, wonderful. Congrats. Yeah. Thank and you so this much. You're welcome. So, and one the second. second, second one is a pocket clinic. Congratulations! Oh. Wonderful. Yeah. And the, the first one is Bia Salvit. Woohoo! Just wonderful. Wow. Wow. In the wow. first place. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you. Bia Salvit, you, you are invited for our finals. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. I'm so yeah. glad. Start packing. Do you have US <laughs> visa? Yeah, I have. <laughs> wow. That's just wonderful. Great. Yes. Um, you yeah, I will contact you later and Absolutely. tell uh, any details about further. So, and now I would please to announce uh, Sasha Johnson and she are going to tell us about VC investment during pandemic. Welcome. And, and, and then we can discuss it together. Yeah. Yeah, you're all welcome to discuss it. So, Sasha. Sasha, you, you're muted. Uh, unmute Sasha, please. I am muted myself. Oh, great. <laughs> Big girl. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> So, uh, I can't stand to have a crystal ball because we all know what industries uh, probably will suffer the most. But right now, it's difficult to predict which industries uh, will thrive. It means that it's a great opportunity for startups to explore new business models and try and shake up the existing industries. And that's when uh, all those disruptions will happen. But first, I would like to say a few words about Brazil, as much as I know about it. I actually have visited Brazil three times. Twice it was in Rio and once in Sao Paulo. And we were guests of the local Venture Capital Association. When we just first started, uh, and uh, I remember thinking how similar all emerging markets are in the sense that 15 years ago, and that was my first visit, there was no venture capital in Brazil. There were all kinds of VC funds that called themselves venture capital funds, but they were not. They were mostly uh, some branches of the banking uh, industry. Some couple of funds were mostly private equity. And then there were several wealthy people who decided that they wanted to invest in technology. And that was 15 years ago. And then for a while, we have not heard much from the Brazilian ecosystem in the sense that here in Silicon Valley, we see startups from all over the world, understandably. And, but then something started to happen five years ago. And uh, uh, the attention, it was unavoidable because uh, if you think of Latin America, Brazil is the most advanced, robust economy. I mean, not to um, offend any other countries in Latin America, but from the perspective of an investor, 
Brazil has been fascinating for the quality of ideas and entrepreneurs that we're developing now. So to fast forward to um, two years ago, uh, the investments into the Brazilian startup ecosystem was over a billion dollars, which is a lot of money if you think of the pretty much compared to Silicon Valley and the other parts of the world. It's, it's, a good, it's, a good, it's a good number. So by now I have to say that I think that the Brazilian innovation ecosystem is quite formed because 15 years ago I was saying like, you know, the role of the government and do we have quality universities and where do we find entrepreneurs? Now, if you look at the quality of the companies, they are um, amazing. And we can mention, I would say like 12 unicorns that came out of Brazil and they are playing all over the world in the world market. And uh, some industries of where they emerged are quite competitive and uh, giving a run for its money to European companies and American companies. Now, that is all before the virus, okay? Because if I give you the name of the company like Jim Pass, amazing. And that company really has turned around all kinds of fitness centers again around the world because they had the right business model and they understood well, what their audience is. Then uh, if you look at the uh, mobile payments, for example, Brazil is the leader in the world in that sector. Because here in the US, we probably were relying on banks while the uh, emerging markets were concentrating on mobile payments. And that is why the software which came out of Brazilian companies when it comes to mobile payments is actually far superior to what we've seen uh, in the local market only because they started earlier. And from what I understand that the mobile penetration is over 100 <laughs> percent it means that everybody in, in brazil is using cell phones to do all kinds of operations that um, are quite advanced then uh, if you look at the companies like cargrex um, the, the delivery systems they enjoy is so competitive and yes that's another brazilian unicorn so what it means that um, local venture funds started paying attention to that market quite seriously and uh, several U.S. funds set up shops. It's mostly in Sao Paulo, but um, I think it reaches out to other parts of Brazil as well. It means that the investments they make are the same quality and structured the same way as they are here in the U.S. So this is the good news. The bad news is that um, those companies will go through the same issues we're going through here and now in Silicon Valley, because if you look after the crisis, uh, if what we call the gig economy, if you just split it in two, it's doing services for you or delivering stuff to you. So companies who are doing services, of course, are hit the hardest, and that is why Uber is laying off people. And there was an equivalent um, in, uh, in Brazil, the company, I forget its name, but you guys know this company. Uh, eventually it was 99, I think the name is, uh, and it was acquired by a Chinese company. So they would have the same issues, but we see, well, do we have fewer drivers, do we have more drivers? So that's to be, uh, still have to be seen. But the company is doing deliveries and the e-commerce in general, that is seeing the amazing raise. It's like, uh, it's rising vertically. So in that sense, the, I would say similar issues as the one we see in, in Silicon Valley. But then um, uh, I caught a little bit of the presentation of the uh, AppTech company. And to me, that is the, um, one of those unfair advantages where uh, you can actually have a domestic market, which will then, if you figure out how to make those sustainable crops and use the technology in Africa, that could spill over first to other Latin American countries and then probably all over the world. So that is a very, very good direction. Then another direction I see Brazil could become a leader, it's telemedicine, it's uh, all kinds of digital health because the quality of education, I visited several universities, uh, is on par with what's needed in the world. And if it's uh, telemedicine, that is the industry that is growing like crazy. The same with education. So I would see uh, really positive developments in the local market in Brazil, which is also spilling over to the West. And uh, the quality of companies that we see coming from Brazil, even to the Valley. And, uh, and I just um, made the latest visit. I was impressed with the pitches there and the companies that I've seen today. Uh, the great player in the market 
I'm going to stop here because I understand that the people have opinions, questions, comments, and I'll be happy to answer or maybe moderate the discussion if we're having one. Anastasia, back to you. Thanks. Thanks, Sasha. It was very interesting. And everybody can join us and tell your things about it. Yeah, we would like to, to hear from the locals how is the yeah, deal exactly. flow. Yes, and comments on what just Sasha said. Well, one of the things I want to tell you that I usually don't believe in the incubators and accelerators because uh, rarely you'll find great companies coming out of them. But when it comes to incubators one day, right? And there is one in San Paulo and it's a startup. I think it's startup park. So anyways, yeah, somebody was going to say something. Yeah, I just want to add a comment here. Uh, here in Brazil, venture capital just focus on uh, the software companies and the hardware companies is a little bit complicated to reach to the market or local market or receive the fund. And for instance, as you can see, two of the startup here and I, my startup as well, reaching out of the Brazil market to receive fund. And that's the complication in market because here they don't uh, not reach that moment to invest in hardware because hardware is very complicated and difficult. This is the problem that we face here and we're looking outside of Brazil to receive fund and uh, invest. Even though it's transferring money to um, local in Brazil, a little bit complicated, we need to have a headquarter or office outside of Brazil. That's that's a part makes uh, our I'm start. Hardware is uh, the companies and hardware are having problems with fundraising all over the world uh, because the venture capital traditionally would avoid it. There were maybe like a couple of years, then it was popular, and then it is not. So if you're looking for investments in hardware, my suggestion is working with the uh, corporate funds or maybe finding a strategic partner that you know that you yourself will not be dealing with production. Because the, when it comes to this whole hardware and manufacturing, it's a whole different thing. So all I'm telling you that it's not an issue for a Brazilian market. That's the issue for startups in that category pretty much all over the world. You're right. So you and good company. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, one uh, one uh, complementary and uh, uh, to to Sasha in a, a point. One of the industries Brazil can be global can uh, bring to the market global services is the ag tech, as you mentioned, because we have enough market here to build the first uh, steps of the company and then hit US and other places. So I invite all the investors from outside, we take a look, close look on the Agitech space in Brazil because we have a lot of good work uh, which can solve a lot of huge problems in the coming next 20 years. I mean, we, will have, we will have a lot of problems to solve uh, in environmental aspects and food production, supply chains, uh, quality of the food in the space. And that's where the world is moving in general. Because uh, now that we are, well, we can talk about impact all we want, but the main definition of it is sustainability. And uh, whatever is happening in the world, people will still need to eat. <laughs> and that sense, uh, the technologies that will come out of the Brazilian market where you can test it locally and then uh, share that knowledge with the rest of the world, I think it's one of the best directions uh, your startup industry can take. I mean, one of them, Actac in Brazil is well known. Yeah, I wonder maybe, maybe to comment on, uh, to agree with Izaki first, and um, to, to kind of build up on Amir's comment about Brazil, where well, myself, who took a decision to become a venture capitalist locally, you know there's the struggle about liquidity and how you will build relationship with other funds to look into the market, you know, and build the critical mass to foster innovation locally. So basically, you will see clusters where investments are more advanced and other clusters where investment is less advanced. The obvious uh, cluster is a fintech and agritech, 
agri agri tech uh, rather on the sense of having a local um, critical mass for building client relationship, right? This is a powerhouse in terms of our great business and it has to be in the forefront of technology. Um, but what, what myself as, as an investor I'm concerned is how now in this crisis, I can continue attracting capital to Brazil. So basically the thesis that I have been on for long is basically a MRR thesis. So I don't believe in a growth startups in Brazil. I believe in startups that know how to grow kind of profitably, but not really profitably, but aware of the unit economics. So as the market turned, um, I'm proud of my portfolio that is managing to survive and, and consider again the reasons to raise capital on next rounds. So kind of reverting back and trying to get Sasha's grasp, how is, from your perspective, foreign investors going to look into the region? Are they just going to hold back or just be more conservative? What do, you be, what do you believe is going to be our next cycle? Well, uh, I'll tell you what I see here. The investments in startups continue, but it's usually later stage investments uh, because it's easier to evaluate their progress and then uh, the valuations are coming down. So for an investor, it's a good time to be picking up uh, companies that already have proven that they're surviving. It's a different story with early stage companies because uh, it's okay to listen to pitches like online, but then making, providing the due diligence on the first company, on, on the, uh, the company you just met would be much harder. So to answer your question, if you already invested in your companies locally, say in, in Brazil, and you already have done all your due diligence and you understand everything like their pros and cons and because now they're part of the global market, then, then you form a partnership and you do a deal with syndication in the outside fund. Because uh, I think it's like Redpoint Ventures that started um, operations in, in Brazil and they have huge operations in the US. So when uh, some years ago you'll say that Silicon Valley invests only in Silicon Valley, it's not the case anymore. But you need to show that say your portfolio company figured out the way how to make wheat which right away is grown without gluten, whatever, whatever the new thing is. I personally don't believe in it, but you know, some, some people do. And uh, then they say, this is the technology. And yes, we tested it in this market. And you have your fields in California, you can adopt that technology here. And then you find the fund that invested in that particular deal here. And that's when you form a partnership. So it's still possible because the due diligence process, if you say that you already uh, took care of that, 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 that's what you do. Then I know uh, SoftBank showed up in Brazil and they put all kinds of money into companies. And uh, people of course would say that SoftBank has problems or whatever, it's not their first crisis, they have enough resources, they will recover. They, I believe they still are in Brazil. So that is a great source of uh, future capital. So, and when it comes to liquidity, I think that for now, you do have big industries that can acquire uh, startups. And of course, it's mostly in software. I'd say if, if it's in a mobile field, then you have your mobile giant that will acquire those companies. So there is one exit. If you want to do an IPO, then I say, look at the company, uh, the one is GPAS. And there's another one, I forget its name, but they're actually, of uh, killing off the competition even in the U.S. So they survived the crisis. They're the ones going in into U.S. companies that didn't survive and then still picking up their employees. So it's uh, all doable, it's harder, but certain things are easier. Because right now, for you to get a meeting as an investor from Brazil, from the venture fund in California, probably logistically would have been very hard, right? But here is, oh, let's have a Zoom meeting look at my portfolio and you have that conversation. So I think that that's your way um, to liquidity, forming partnerships with the funds outside Brazil. But you're doing the nurturing and grooming of the first stage yourself, because that will be your value add. That's what I think. Thanks, thanks a lot for the answer. Yeah. 
Anastasia, tell people what to do. Anastasia, yeah. don't hear you. But so yeah, any other opinions? <laughs> Anastasia, maybe you oh. will tell us what will be our next battles, where and when, or maybe so, Anna. Not we'll, it. Yes, we'll not only tell, we will show. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we are online, we can share a screen. Yeah, right? yeah Anastasia. So, that, yeah, the next startup will be in Milan. And this June is uh, Thursday. Yeah, and then we're going to yeah. Scandinavia. And the week after that, we will be in uh, Tokyo and uh, also and lots of other events. Oh, yeah, and, and <laughs> Turkey and Turkey, okay. Tokyo, and Chicago. Tokyo, yeah, Tokyo. Okay. Absolutely. So, you are all welcome to join us here yeah, as a guest and travel together with us all over the world right <laughs> yeah it's a good opportunity for now to join any country <laughs> and okay what going we on. would like to see all, all of you online and uh please reach out to us uh join our vc house where vcs meet together discuss their uh vc thing without any uh people hearing them and uh, share their deals. And we are always glad to see you online with us at our unicorn battles. But, uh, just from that question I got just from the gentleman uh, a minute ago, I think there is this real need for uh, venture funds from all over the world to be able to exchange deals. So this VC house as a platform is really something that is needed because you get, you know, a fund from Tokyo or a fund from Brazil, a fund from wherever, Italy, Silicon Valley, and they all say, okay, this is an opportunity. These, are my companies are doing fundraising, and uh, when it comes from an investor presenting a company, it's different, because this way, you actually show the progress of the company, not the founder say, yeah, we're great, we changed the world, it's so wonderful. But if you're an investor, you have different metrics. So I think that being able to exchange that kind of information in a secure way, and, uh, and then who knows, maybe uh, this VC house will become a platform for deal making around the world. So, but we need to start small, like, you know, what the group who actually is interested in. Maybe that's what, um, what should, the next step should be. Hmm? Absolutely, yes. N Natalie left her uh, contact details, so you can contact contact her directly or contact me or contact Anastasia and we will tell you how to apply to our VC house and we will see everyone online it was we were glad all to see you yeah uh, thanks for coming good day to everyone who are our dear friends in California good night to all our Asian and African friends and <laughs> see you all online in all other time zones Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, it was a great our first event and right.